right, so we're going to pick up on uh, the Dharma and the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and actually, I, what I've written on your handout is that uh, we're going to look at Dharma and Yoga in the Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita. And then uh, at the very end, we'll kind of move away from the texts, the, the, um, the Shruti, which we've moved away from, but also the Smriti, uh, and uh, look at one school of um, philosophy or one school of thought within uh, Hinduism known as Advaita Vedanta, uh, which is, uh, there's more than one, there's multiple, uh, and uh, this is the one that I think the way it reads the Upanishads is uh, if someone has a vague kind of knowledge of Hinduism, they're usually thinking along the lines of uh, what they've heard in a very um, superficial form from the advice of Vedanta. And, you know, speaking of superficial form, just like everything else that we've talked about so far, we're just skimming over the surface. So, uh, you know, there's so much more depth, there's so much more we could be talking about, but we're not talking about. And, uh, and like I said this morning, I haven't given you really any sense of what Hinduism looks like as a lived experience among a group of people who have been born and raised in it and for whom it is their language of faith and their tradition. And hopefully that's what we'll get next week when we have our guest speaker. How did you find him? Uh, I just went to Hindu Center of Virginia's website and sent them an email. Mm. Yeah, and and they were uh, responded right away, uh, and um, so it was very good. Um, I think that means that we'll, we'll probably have someone really good to come and talk to us. Uh, so. We want to look back at, at Dharma for a minute, and uh, I know we've talked about Dharma a lot, but it's important just to keep holding this up because uh, Dharma is not just your duty, your duty as an individual, your duty in society. Uh, it, it's also, in that sense, uh, a way of speaking about the social order, and then even more than that, the cosmic order. So that if everyone is doing their dharma, there is harmony throughout the universe. Right? All things work together when everyone is engaged in their dharma. And there's only problems when people are engaged in adharma, when they're, do when they're going against their dharma, when things are no longer moving with the grain of the universe. And that there are major consequences of adharma. Um, if you are engaged in a dharma, if you're, if you're going against your dharma, uh, that's going to accrue bad karma for you, but it's also going to, it's like throwing a monkey wrench in the whole machinery of the universe. It, it means that society is going to, you know, break down, even if just a little bit, it's going to mean that the cosmos themselves, the uh, the relationship of all beings to one another and to the devas, all of that's going to be affected by uh, Adharma. Uh, and so this is something that's much larger than, than ourselves and uh, the consequences affect us beyond just this life. Uh, they will affect us in the ways that we are reborn to die again in the cycle of samsara. We're, we're all on board with that, right? I know we've, we've kind of touched on that each, each week for the past couple weeks now. Uh, but it's important because we saw that in the um, Ramayana, we had this great example of what, what it looks like when uh, the twice born, when uh, Kshatriya, uh, and uh, his wife and uh, his brothers, when they're all doing their dharma, 
uh, how it set things right, even if there is the presence of a demon and a Sora that's trying to cause problems. Uh, that uh, by doing Dharma, not just the earth is saved, not just the kingdom is saved, but it even, uh, it even saves the devas, the gods, in a sense, because they couldn't do anything about this particular Ravana, if you remember the, the Asura, the demon. They couldn't do anything about it. But uh, Rama, the avatar of uh, Deva Vishnu, by becoming human was able to, by being reborn as a human, was able to defeat the demon, the Asura, Ravana, and in doing so, restore Dharma. So that was a great story, that's the great uh, epic of uh, an exemplar and the example of restoring Dharma. The one we're going to look at today, much longer than the Ramayana, is the Mahabharata. And the Mahabharata uh, is not at all as clear an example of good dharma, doing your dharma. Uh, so Mahabharata uh, means uh, something like Great India, uh, uh, Bharat or Bharata is actually what uh, folks who are from India call India. Remember, we call it by the name of the Indus River. That's a, a, a little something we picked up from the ancient Greeks when they went that way. You, you know, of course, that Alexander the Great, the Macedonian, uh, led an army all the way to India. Uh, and so, um, we have been calling it after that river's name, after the name of the river Indus ever since. But uh, in India they call, uh, call that place their home, Bharat, Bharata. Uh, and Maha, you might uh, recognize that. For example, we're going to watch the movie Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi's name was Mohandas Gandhi, but he's often known as Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, Atman meaning soul and Maha meaning great, great soul. But you could also translate it as Big India if you wanted. Uh, Mahabharata, Great India, Big India. Written somewhere between 400 BC and 400 CE. It probably wasn't all written down at one time, uh, but as these kinds of stories, uh, these kinds of oral traditions that then get recorded as, as these often happen. Uh, parts of it get written down and then parts of it get added to it later as it kind of draws into its orbit other stories that were perhaps local stories in this place or that place. They get drawn into this larger story. Uh, it's a massive text. It's a massive text, way longer than the Bible, way longer than the Iliad and the Odyssey put together. Uh, and if the Ramayana is the kind of gives you the example of good Dharma, uh, the Mahabharata is all about, you might say, the subtlety of Dharma. It raises the question of uh, what do you do, for example, when you have different uh, duties, different dharma being placed upon you by your different stations in life? What if those, uh, what if your varna, your, your dharma based on your place in the caste system, on, on the varna, what if that has you do one thing, but your role in your family gives you a different dharma. There's another expectation and that these don't necessarily coincide and maybe even they, they seem to conflict. It's the Mahabharata that kind of explores some of that. And uh, therefore, the Ramayana takes place in the second or Treta Yuga 
the second age, uh, when there's only a little bit of uh, Adharma in the universe, when things are still pretty close to being uh, a golden age. But the Mahabharata takes place in the third yuga, right towards the end of the third yuga and before the fourth yuga, our yuga, the Kali yuga, the fourth age, the last and worst age uh, is about to start. Uh, so we see this kind of uh, way in which the cosmos is devolving, society is devolving, <coughs> people are devolving. Uh, there's no way that we can cover even a little bit of the story, but we're going to focus on just a couple episodes in the Mahabharata. Uh, it begins when uh, Shantanu, Shantanu uh, is reborn uh, in the world of mortals, in our world. He had been living uh, among the devas in heaven, uh, and uh, there was a slight wind. It uh, blew up the sari of uh, a, a devi, a goddess, Ganga, the, uh, the goddess of the Ganges River. Uh, everyone, because everyone uh, in heaven does their dharma, looked away. But uh, Shantanu, Shantanu did not look away. His eyes lingered for a moment when her sari blew up. And uh, for this, he was reborn as a mortal as a Kshatriya, uh, and he is uh, the Kuru king of Hasanapura, uh, and actually he, he is able to, Ganga is reborn as a mortal also, and he's able to marry her, uh, so his, his wife is the Ganges. Uh, I don't want to... I've, I've put some of the, this other stuff in here, and I'm going to skip over it because I, I think it's just going to be too confusing. But uh, what you should know is uh, we get this lineage coming down from him that becomes very convoluted. And so it becomes unclear who the rightful heir should be, who the rightful king of Hastinapura should be. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, well, there, there's really two um, possibilities. Uh, there, there are three sons of Vyasa, and Vyasa is actually supposed to be the, uh, the you know, the composer of the Mahabharata. He's the poet who is who is telling the tale. But he's also a character in the story, too. So it's, it's as if Homer had written himself into the Iliad and the Odyssey. And uh, he, it's one of his two children is supposed to become uh, the king. Uh, he actually has three children, Dhritarashtra, Pandu, and Vidura. Uh, and uh, it should be the older of, of them, Dhritarashtra, Dhritarashtra, should become the king, except he's born blind. And that disqualifies him to be king. And you might think, that's, that's a kind of a, a cruel thing to do. I mean, do you really have to be able to see to be king, can't you? order people around just as easily without sight. And in fact, we see that uh, Dhritarashtra is pretty capable uh, throughout the, the epic. He's, he, he doesn't seem to be slowed down by his blindness, so why can't he be king? Uh, he can't be king because if he's born blind, that means that he did something in a past life to deserve to be born blind which means that uh, he's clearly uh, not, uh, 
not in, a, in the same position, at the same level of his younger brother, Pandu. So the, the throne actually passes to Pandu. Uh, Dhritarashtra, though, does have uh, uh, an active love life, and he fathers over a hundred sons. These are the Kauravas. And, uh, you know, spoiler alert, the Kauravas are the bad guys in this story. They're the ones that we're, we're not supposed to like. Dhritarashtra is not so bad, but the Kauravas are the ones who, who were, his sons are the ones that were uh, rooting against. Uh, particularly the eldest of his sons, uh, Duryodhana, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, who believes that uh, his father was denied the throne uh, although he, he does end up reigning as regent anyway, uh, but initially denied the throne. Uh, and therefore, uh, as Dhritarashtra's eldest son, he deserves the throne after his father. He's the rightful heir. Now on the other side we have Pandu, the younger brother of Dhritarashtra, uh, and he actually... Uh, so he, he, it's his sons, his five sons, uh, who aren't actually his sons. Uh, I mean, they're his sons, but their actual fathers are the Devas, not Pandu himself, which is another kind of monkey wrench in the machine. It's meant to make it unclear who actually has the rightful claim to the throne, right? Because these are not Pandu's biological children. But his five sons, the Pandavas, they're the ones that uh, we're, we're supposed to be. They're the, they're the team. They're the home team. They're, they're the ones that we're backing. They're the ones that we want to see win out. They're the good guys in the story. Because we're in spaghetti western, they'd all be wearing the white hats. Uh, and the core of us would be wearing the black hats. Uh, Pandu, who has the throne, leaves the throne. He, he uh, renounces it, becomes a sannyasin. You remember sannyasin as a renunciant. The laws of Manu tell, tell us that that's something you shouldn't do until you're in your extreme <coughs> old age, but he uh, didn't want to wait. He, he takes off to be a sannyasin. Uh, regency passes to Dhritarashtra, uh, but there's the question of, once they're old enough, who will take the throne? Does it belong to Dur Duryodhana? Dur I'm sorry, I'm not going to say this right. Duryodhana, or does it belong to Yudhishthira, who is the eldest son of Pandu? Of course, not biologically, but he's the eldest of the Pandavas. Uh, Something else you should know, because all of the, uh, the sons of Pandu, all of the Panda, Pandavas, the five Pandavas, uh, because their fathers are Devas, uh, they exemplify these virtues, different virtues, depending on which Deva was their father. Uh, and so... Uh, among them, Yudhisthira, the eldest, is the most virtuous. He, he is supposed to exemplify, uh, you know, just, uh, he's supposed to be like Rama. He's supposed to exemplify, uh, you know, dharmic virtue, right? He does his dharma. Uh, he can't lie, for example. He always tells the truth. Uh, the other Pandava that I'm going to tell you about, I know that there's five, but we're only going to talk about two, is Arjuna. Uh, and Arjuna uh, is the greatest of the warriors, of the Pandavas, but also of the Kauravas. He is the greatest warrior because of who his father is among the Devas. Uh, and of course, there are all Kshatriyas, right? 
They're, none of them are Brahmins, none of them are Vaishyas or Shudra. They're all Kshatriyas. That's their place in the Varna. Uh, so, what happens? Well, uh, Yudhisthira gets challenged to a game, to a gambling game. What do you think was used to gamble with? Dice. Dice, yeah. He gets, he gets challenged to a game of dice by Duryodhana, and Duryodhana fixes the game. So uh, Yudhishthira loses again and again and again at dice, uh, and each time he keeps betting more and more and more. So he loses the, uh, his queen, he loses his kingdom, and uh, at the end of this extended game of dice, uh, he and his brothers have been sent into exile, just like what happened to Rama. Uh, so here comes that, that old tricky dice again, causing problems. And, uh, and so the true heir to the throne, just like in the Ramayana, is now sent into exile. Well, after the period of exile, they come back to claim the throne. But the Kauravas, for some reason, aren't ready to give it up and hand it over and say, welcome back. They're not like Rama's brother, Bharata, who just gives the throne back as soon as Rama returns. Right? This is an age that is, that is steeped in Adharma. And so they're going to hang on to the throne. The climax of the story is when the forces of the Pandavas meet the forces of the Kauravas in battle. And they do so at the Kurekshastra. I think I'm saying correct. Kure, no, I'm not going to try. Anyway, they do so on this field of battle. Actually, I, I could just read it out here instead of trying to remember. Uh, so they, 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 uh, they're joined in battle. Uh, on the Kurekshatra, Kurekshatra, or the, as it's called in the Bhagavad Gita, the Dharmakshatra, the field of Kuru, the field of battle, which will become in the Bhagavad Gita the field of Dharma. Uh, we'll come back to the Bhagavad Gita because right before the battle, is when the Bhagavad Gita takes place. The Bhagavad Gita was, most scholars think, a later writing that gets inserted into the Mahabharata. So we're going to come back to that in a minute. But for now, uh, and does somebody have the time? Because I don't know how much time. 3.41. 3.41, okay. So I've got, I've got a little bit of time. All right, so they come to this battle. And... Uh, it just so happens that Arjuna has uh, a cousin. They're all cousins, by the way, of course. They're all cousins. Arjuna has a cousin, though, named Krishna. And Krishna is driving his chariot for him, which is a lower rank than Arjuna himself. So Arjuna assumes that Krishna is just, uh, you know, your average guy. But we know that Krishna is, in fact, the avatar of Vishnu in this yuga, in this age. Uh, so, Vishnu, in, as Krishna, begins to uh, advise and counsel the Pandavas who are greatly outnumbered, by the way, in how to win this war. And one of the things that comes up is that because they are so outnumbered, they're going to have to play dirty. 
They, they can't just uh, go out there and meet the Korovas on the field of battle and hope that somehow they're going to pull through. Krishna teaches them how to fight dirty. And I won't give you all the examples, I'm just going to give you one example. On the Korova side is a man named Drona. Drona had, was a, a great warrior. He was a guru for both the Pandavas and the Kauravas as they were growing up. He taught them how to fight. He taught them how to be warriors. Uh, and he is fighting on the side of the Kauravas. And so is his son, Ashwatthama. And uh, he's just tearing into the Pandavas' forces. It, it seems like they, they don't have any hope against him. Well, what they know, what Krishna tells them, is that if Ashwatthana, let me make sure I'm saying it, Ashwatthana, if he were to die, this is Drona's son, that Drona would just give up all hope and quit fighting. Well, they, they can't get to him. They can't get to Ashwatthama. He's too good of a warrior to kill him. Uh, so what they do is, or again, Krishna's advice, they get an elephant. They name the elephant Ashwatthama. They kill the elephant. They send word to Drona that Ashwatthama is dead. He's been killed in the battle. Now, Drona, he's a clever guy. He's not just going to take the word of some messenger. So he seeks out, he seeks out Yudhisthira because he knows that Yudhisthira, the eldest of the Pandu brothers, the Pandava brothers, can only speak the truth. He's so committed to the Dharma that he can only speak truthfully. So he seeks out Yudhisthira and says, is it true? Is my son dead? And again, on Krishna's urging, Yudhisthira says, uh, Ashwapama is dead. And then he kind of says, very quietly, I mean the elephant, not your son. But at the same time, Krishna gets all the rest of the Pandava forces to make a big clamor of noise so the Drona can't hear Yudhisthira say, the elephant, not your son. So all that Drona hears is, Aswakma is dead. He ceases battle right in the midst of the field of battle, and he's quickly killed. It's these kinds of things that Krishna is advising them to do that in an earlier age, in an earlier yuga, would clearly be a dharma. It would be a sin. This is wrong. This is not the way you wage war. This is not honorable. But Krishna is telling them that because they are evil, because the Kauravas and what they have done are evil, it's okay to do these kinds of things that might seem like they're a dharma for the greater good, essentially. All right, uh, there's one final uh, situation. The, the Pandavas win, they regain the throne, but, uh, I mean, the, the killing is immense. Many, many are dead. And finally, at the end of the story, Yudhisthira uh, leaves in search of Indra's heaven beyond the Himalayas. He goes with his dog where he can be reunited with his brothers. He gets there and he finds out his brothers, the other four Pandavas, are in hell. Now he has a choice. Will he stay in Indra's heaven beyond the Himalayas? Or will he go to hell and be with his brothers? He chooses hell with his brothers. This was the right answer. He finds out that that was the last test. And all five of the Pandavas and Yudhisthira's dog are in Indra's heaven. And that's where it ends. Okay. Any, any questions about that before we move to the Bhagavad Gita?
This could make a really good video game. <laughs> it could make a good video game. And it's been made into uh, a movie and a TV miniseries. And uh, so it's, um, yeah. So the, the Bhagavad Gita, like I said, gets inserted into the Mahabharata. Uh, and it gets inserted right before this great battle before the Pandavas and uh, the Kauravas. The Bhagavad Gita, which means Song of the Lord, uh, the Bhagavad Gita begins when they're about to go into battle and Arjuna turns to his charioteer, Krishna, and he says, wait, stop, and he puts down his bow and it's as if time freezes. And he says to Krishna, how can I do this? I'm about to go out and kill my brothers, my cousins, my kin. How can I do that? Now, it, it might be helpful to actually read, read some of this. So, uh, here's, here's from the Bhagavad Gita. This is Arjuna speaking. Oh Krishna, I see my own relations here anxious to fight. And my limbs grow weak. My mouth is dry, my body shakes, and my hair is standing on end. My skin burns, and the bow Gandava has slipped from my hand. I am unable to stand. My mind seems to be whirling. These signs bode evil for us. I do not see that any good can come from killing our relations in battle. O oh Krishna, I have no desire for victory or for a kingdom or pleasures. Of what use is a kingdom or pleasures or even life if those for whose sake we desire these things, teachers, fathers, sons, grandfathers, uncles, in-laws, grandsons, and others with family ties are engaging in this battle, renouncing their wealth and their lives. Even if they were to kill me, I would not want to kill them not even to become ruler of the three worlds, how much less for the earth alone. O Krishna, what satisfaction could we find in killing Dhritarashtra's sons? We would become sinners by slaying these men, even though they are evil. The sons of Dhritarashtra are related to us, therefore we should not kill them. How can we gain happiness by killing members of our own family. And he goes on like that. He, he, he basically uh, says, we, I, my dharma to my family should keep me from killing my cousins. Well, Krishna's first response is, is to kind of, uh, you know, verbally slap him around a little bit. Uh, you might even say to, to bully him. He says, uh, you know, what are you, a coward? You know, buck up. You know, you can't get cold feet right before the battle starts. You got to get out there and be a man. Well, that, that doesn't seem to work. Uh, it's, it's not going to quell Arjuna's fears about engaging in a dharma. So then Krishna takes another attack. He gets philosophical with Arjuna. Uh, he says, this is Krishna now speaking, the impermanent has no reality. Reality lies in the eternal. Those who have seen the boundary between these two have attained the end of all knowledge. Realize that which pervades the universe is indestructible. No power can affect this unchanging, imperishable reality. The body is mortal, but that which dwells in the body is immortal and immeasurable. Therefore, Arjuna, fight in this battle. One believes he is the slayer. Another believes he is the slain. Both are ignorant. There is neither slayer nor slain. You were never born. You will never die. You have never changed. 
you can never change. Unborn, eternal, immutable, immemorial, you do not die when the body dies. Realizing that which is indestructible, eternal, unborn, and unchanging, how can you slay, how can you slay or cause another to slay? In other words, he's saying, uh, look, you think that you're about to go out there and kill your cousins, but in fact, from the perspective of eternity, they're already dead, and yet they're also already eternally alive. They will be reborn again and again and again. You have no power to actually kill what is true about them. You can only kill the body. That's what uh, Krishna says. And he goes on. He says, consider your dharma. You should not vacillate. For a warrior, nothing is higher than a war against evil. The warrior confronted with such a war should be pleased, Arjuna, for it comes as an open gate to heaven. But if you do not participate in this battle against evil, you will incur sin, violating your dharma and your honor. The story of your dishonor will be repeated endlessly, and for a man of honor, dishonor is worse than death. These brave warriors will think you have withdrawn from battle out of fear, and those who formerly esteemed you will treat you with disrespect. Your enemies will ridicule your strength and say things that should not be said. What could be more painful than this? Death means the attainment of heaven. Victory means the enjoyment of the earth. Therefore, rise up, Arjuna, resolve to fight. Having made yourself alike in pain and pleasure, profit and loss, victory and defeat, engage in this great battle, and you will be freed from sin, or adharma. So, Krishna, again, pressing him to do his dharma, telling him that his dharma as a chatriya is more important than his dharma to his family. That his, his, his dharma based on varna is more important than family dharma. Well, uh, we can't go, go too far into that, but uh, essentially Krishna continues to engage Arjuna both uh, philosophically uh, while also tr just trying to encourage him to go out and do his dharma. Uh, and uh, along the way, uh, Krishna sets out uh, three different forms of yoga. Now, when we hear yoga, we think, uh, you know, what Jenny Smith does, right? I mean, we think the, the bodily poses, you know, downward dog or something. I don't even know what they are, right? I've never done it. But anyway, we think of what in India would be called hatha yoga. This is, these are just the, the physical practices that are meant to prepare you uh, for the other forms. But yoga itself comes from the same root as uh, our word yoke. Right? To be yoked to something. Uh, so you might think of when Jesus says, uh, you know, uh, take on my yoke, uh, for it is light. Right? And he's talking about becoming one of his disciples. The same thing is kind of going on here. Yoga means uh, spiritual discipline. Not necessarily, we mean it, we've, we've taken it and kind of twisted it, its use here in the West, but it just means a spiritual discipline. Uh, and he, uh, he being Krishna, identifies three yogas. Uh, jnana yoga, the way of knowledge, karma, yoga, the way of action, and bhakti, yoga, the way of love, or the way of devotion to a deva. Uh, and he's, he starts off talking about this, this way of knowledge when he's getting philosophical with Arjuna, but he really kind of leaves that aside and begins to focus on karma, yoga, and bhakti, yoga, after that. And and he sees these, these are not mutually exclusive. They build off of each other and they work together. Uh, he will uh, essentially advise Arjuna that he should engage in karma yoga. He should engage in the way of action. 
uh, because he says you, you can never not act. Uh, you know, the historian Howard Zinn said you can't stand still on a moving train. It's that kind of thing. Even the desire to renounce action, according to Krishna in this, is an action. Uh, it is karma. And so you can't escape karma and samsara by renouncing. And what you hear here is a rejection, again, of the kind of thing you see in Buddha and Mahavira. This, this thing, you remember, the Buddha lived before the Bhagavad Gita was written, before the laws of Manu were written. Uh, he was a Kshatriya who became a sannyasin, but early in his life, right after he had married and had a child, Buddha renounces the world and goes off to seek spiritual enlightenment. He becomes a renunciant, a sannyasin. And we had the laws of Manu, Manu saying, don't do that. Because the most important time, dharmic time for you is when you are a father and a householder and you're contributing to society. You can become a sannyasin later in life. Here we have Krishna saying, even if you go become a sannyasin, you renounce everything, it's still uh, karmic action. You're still doing, uh, you're still involved in action. You can't escape karma, you can't escape the uh, cycle of samsara by renouncing the world and speaking, or seeking spiritual enlightenment. So you have to engage in karma, that, uh, in action that is, uh, that is disciplined by your dharma. That's what he says. And the way that it's disciplined by your dharma is for you to not be worried about the consequences about the results of your action. You, you want to be detached from that. Your dharma tells you what to do, and you'll, you'll wrap yourself up in all sorts of intellectual spider webs if you uh, start spinning these thoughts about, well, should I do my dharma to my family, or should I do my dharma according to my varna, or so on and so forth. You'll just get yourself all wrapped up uh, instead, don't worry that, for example, Arjuna, you're going off to kill your cousins. Just do your dharma. Be detached from the results of that. It may be, Arjuna, that you go off into this battle and you are killed. Be detached from that. If that's the way it is, that's the way it is. But you do your dharma. That's what's important. Be detached from the results. Uh, well, Arjuna says, okay, that's great. But if I'm detached from the results, what is my motivation for doing my dharma? What, what, what is the whole purpose of this? Why do all this? And that's when Krishna goes into bhakti yoga. You do it out of love for me, Krishna says. You do it out of devotion to me, Vishnu. Uh, up to this point, Arjuna does not really recognize, does not realize that Krishna is Vishnu. But as, as Krishna begins to explain to him that he is to do what he does uh, as an offering out of love and devotion and faith to him, uh, Arjuna starts to figure it out. Oh, okay. Uh, so Krishna is actually Vishnu. And then Arjuna asks him, can I see you in your true form then? Not this human body that you put on for the moment. But let me see you how you really look. He says, just as you have described your infinite glory, O Lord, now I long to see it. I want to see you as the supreme ruler of creation, O Lord, master of yoga. If you think me strong enough to behold it, show me your immortal self. And this is Krishna's reply. Behold, Arjuna, 
a million divine forms with an infinite variety of color and shape. Behold the gods of the natural world and many more wonders never revealed before. Behold the entire cosmos turning within my body and the other things you desire to see. But these things cannot be seen with your physical eyes. Therefore I give you spiritual vision to perceive my majestic power. And uh, then we get a third person, uh, Sanjaya, who's able to see all the things that are happening uh, on the battlefield, describe what it is that Arjuna begins to see. He says, having spoken these words, Krishna, the master of yoga, revealed to Arjuna his most exalted lordly form. He appeared with an infinite number of faces. Or ornamented by heavenly jewels, displaying unending miracles and the countless weapons of his power, clothed in celestial garments and covered with garlands, sweet-smelling with heavenly fragrances, he showed himself as the infinite Lord, the source of all wonders, whose face is everywhere. If a thousand suns were to rise in the heavens at the same time, the blaze of their light would resemble the splendor of that supreme spirit. There, within the body of the God of Gods, Arjuna saw all the manifold forms of the universe united as one, filled with amazement, his hair standing on end in ecstasy. He bowed before the Lord with joined palms and spoke these words. And so here's Arjuna again. O Lord, I see within your body all the gods and every lit kind of living creature. I see Brahma, the creator, seated on a lotus. I see the ancient sages and the celestial serpents. I see infinite mouths and arms, stomachs and eyes, and you are embodied in every form. I see you everywhere, without beginning, middle, or end. You are the Lord of all creation, and the cosmos is your body. You wear a crown and carry a mace and, dis and discus. Now, these are the, that's a traditional uh, iconography for Vishnu, the crown, the mace, the discus. Your radiance is blinding and immeasurable. I see you, who are so difficult to behold, shining like a fiery sun, blazing in every direction. You are the supreme, changeless reality, the one thing to be known. You are the refuge of all creation, the immortal spirit, the eternal guardian of eternal dharma. You are without beginning, middle, or end. You touch everything with your infinite power. The sun and moon are your eyes, and your mouth is fire. Your radiance warms the cosmos. O oh Lord, your presence fills the heavens and the earth reaches in every direction. I see the three worlds trembling before this vision of your wonderful and terrible form. The gods enter your being, some calling out and greeting you in fear. Great saints, sing your glory, praying, may all be well. The multitude of gods, demigods, and demons are all overwhelmed by the sight of you. O oh, mighty Lord, at the sight of your myriad eyes and mouths and arms and legs, stomachs and fearful teeth, I and the entire universe shake in terror. And here he addresses Krishna as Vishnu. O oh, Vishnu, I can see your eyes shining with open mouth. You glitter in an array of colors and your body touches the sky. I look at you and my heart trembles. I have lost all courage and all peace of mind. When I see your mouths with their fearful teeth, mouths burning like the fires at the end of time, I forget where I am and I have no place to go. O oh Lord, you are the support of the universe. Have mercy on me. I see all the sons of Dhritarashtra, that is the Kauravas. I see Bhishma, Drona, and Karna. I see our warriors and all the kings who are here to fight. All are rushing into your awful jaws. I see some of them crushed by your teeth as rivers flow into the ocean. All the warriors of this world are passing into your fiery jaws. All creatures rush to their destruction like moths into a flame. You lap the worlds into your burning mouths and swallow them. Filled with your terrible radiance, O Vishnu, the whole creation bursts into flames. Tell me who you are, O Lord of terrible form. I bow before you, have mercy. I want to know who you are. You who existed before all creation, your nature and workings confound me. And so we, we have a little bit more of an exchange between Krishna and Arjuna. Uh, and uh, at one point, 
Arjuna says, oh, now that I know who you really are, I'm sorry if I ever called you any bad names or, or treated you unkindly when I thought you were just my cousin Krishna. Uh, and finally, uh, he says, um, I can't take it anymore. I, I can't look on you anymore. Uh, please go back to your form as Krishna. And he does. And finally, uh, in his form as Krishna, he directs Arjuna once again to bhakti, to love and devotion of him. Now that he knows his true nature as uh, the ultimate reality that has created all the devas and all things and so on and so forth. Uh, and so uh, I, think, I think that's probably enough of reading from, from this. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, after all of this, Krishna has finally convinced Arjuna that it is good and right for him to go out and to kill the Kauravas and to do so as an offering to Krishna, to Vishnu, not connected to the results of it, not so that he can win uh, the throne or, or, or regain the kingdom, but because simply it is his dharma, and he does it out of love and devotion for Vishnu, who, who establishes and is the guardian of dharma. So that's the Bhagavad Gita. Now I know that that sounds really violent, and some people have used it to justify violence, and other people have used it as, uh, read it metaphorically to talk about the internal battle within the soul. So we're going to watch some of the movie Gandhi. Gandhi loved the Gita, and it's, it's perhaps the one piece of writing that you find in nearly every Hindu household. Uh, and uh, Gandhi loved the Gita, and he read it entirely from a nonviolent perspective as the internal struggle, the internal struggle uh, and coming to the love of Vishnu. Uh, the person who assassinated Gandhi loved the Gita, read the Gita, and appealed to the Gita in his trial for the assassination of Gandhi, saying that it was the lessons of the Gita that led him to assassinate Gandhi. So, just like any other text, it can be read for violence, or it can be read uh, for uh, a higher spiritual purpose. Do we have enough time for me to talk about Advaita Vedanta, or are you, are you sick of me talking? It's 411. It's 411. What if I do it really quick? Would that be okay? All right. I said that before the Mahabharata gets written down, before uh, the Gita, we have examples of not Brahmins, but Kshatriyas, uh, folks within the Kshatriya uh, um, Varna, who leave, they renounce uh, their place as warrior, as ruler, uh, to go become sannyasins and seek uh, spiritual enlightenment. Uh, this seems to be something that uh, the Gita wants to, uh, you know, try and argue against, just like the Manusmriti tries to argue against. Uh, but there is uh, very much within Hinduism a uh, tradition of folks who wish to seek spiritual enlightenment uh, and renounce the expectations of family life and home and so on and so forth. Uh, and they follow different paths, uh, some the karma yoga, but that tends to be more the folks who stay and, and live according to the Manu Smriti. Uh, some of them engage in bhakti yoga, they, they want to dedicate their lives and devotion to one of the devas. Uh, but there's also a tradition in the jnana, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, yoga, the way of knowledge, uh, which um, 
does, it also has elements of the others, the other yogas in it, uh, but it focuses on understanding the, uh, the Upanishads in particular and the teachings of the Upanishads, which you'll remember are Shruti. They're part of uh, the basic uh, scriptures of Hinduism. And uh, in particular, uh, there is a school at Veda Vedanta, uh, which means uh, um, Vedanta is the end of the Vedas, referring to the Upanishads, uh, and uh, Advaita is non-duality. Uh, and uh, the person that you want to know about is Adi Shankara, who lived uh, from 788 to 820 CE, that's, or AD, so uh, we're looking at, um, you know, uh, what we might call the, the Dark Ages of, um, of Europe. Uh, this is after folks like St. Augustine, but before the High Medieval Period with St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, Adi Shankara, was the founder of Advaita Vedanta. He was a teacher. He set up what, you, what we might call, uh, I mean, what, what, what would be called an ashram, but what we might call a monastery. He set up uh, a school, a monastic school. Uh, and he uh, wrote on the, um, the Upanishads. So he, um, he wrote the Crest Jewel of Wisdom and, and some other writings, and there have been other teachers within this tradition. Uh, you remember that I talked about uh, Jiva and Atman uh, as being, in an early stage, basically synonymous. By the time you get to Advaita Vedanta, they have distinguished Jiva as this, your individual soul. Uh, which which uh, carries your individuality with it, you know. What makes Sid Sid? What makes Patty Patty? Uh, that's what passes, uh, gets reborn uh, again and again, to die again and again in a cycle of samsara. Uh, but the Upanishads will often speak of the Atman, and Advaita Vedanta says the Atman is... Uh, something even more basic than the jiva. Uh, it's who you truly are. So not based on your individuality, but based on uh, the eternal ground of all beings, all souls, uh, are grounded in Atman. And uh, what you need to do well, and, and Atman has, is kind of threefold. Uh, its threefold nature is Sat, Chit, Ananda. Sat is being, so it's your, your Atman is what, what provides your being. It's, it's uh, how you exist in the first place, how your Jiva exists in the first place. Uh, it's where your consciousness comes from. Not your individual mind, not your ego, but your consciousness, right? That that elusive first-person perspective that somehow even precedes your individuality. Uh, and it's ananda, it's bliss. It's, it's the deepest desire of your being. Right? Uh, and what you need to do is recognize that you, the truth of who you are is your Atman, is Atman. Not your Atman, but Atman. Not your Jiva. Not your mind, not your body. Atman. That's who you truly are. There's another uh, important concept, and that's Brahman. This shows up again in the Upanishads. Now, Brahman originally was uh, a word used to describe the power of the devas. Why are the devas uh, able to do things that we mere mortals can't do? How come they can live forever? How come they have these powers? Uh, they, they get their power from Brahman. But it comes to me in the Upanishads and in the Vedantic traditions after the Upanishads 
the ground of all being. It is the source and ground of all being. In a sense, in the Gita, Krishna is saying he's Vishnu, but as Vishnu, he's also saying that beyond being Vishnu, he's, he's Brahman. He's identifying not just as Vishnu, the Deva, but also as Brahman. Uh, so Brahman is the ground of all being. Uh, what you need to do is to understand that you are Atman, and Atman is Brahman. That's the knowledge you need to have to achieve spiritual enlightenment, liberation from the cycle of samsara. You, you get that through, uh, through learning from uh, a guru in the uh, Vedantic tradition, but you also get it through uh, jnana or meditation, long years spent in meditation. This is what hatha yoga, the, all those poses, can help you with. And that's what they're meant to do. They're meant to help you with this. They're not a, an end in themselves. And they're not meant to just get you fit. Uh, but they're meant to help you in meditation, so that in meditation you can have samadhi, which is the realization, that, that moment of clarity in meditation, when you realize that you are Atman, and Atman is Brahman. Uh, and when that comes, when you have that realization, uh, which is not something that can be put into words or be taught. When you have that realization, you will achieve moksha, which is freedom or liberation from the cycle of samsara, the cycle of birth and death and rebirth only to die again and again and again. All right, I think that is where I'm going to end. Uh, and we'll watch the movie now. And have our guest speaker next week. Question. Back yeah. in the 60s, when the Beatles were around, and there was this big movement for everybody to go... TM, Transcendental Meditation. Yeah. yeah. What, what, is, what were they, they doing? Were they doing this? Were they studying this? Or what? what uh, the gurus? So, so I, 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 I don't know exactly, but, but uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. Right. Uh, so, th th I mean, this is the kind of thing you don't just pick up as a hobby in your spare time, right? I mean, the, the, these, these folks are monks, right? They, they, they have dedicated their lives to this. The rest of us in, in traditional Hinduism would, would eventually work our way towards this goal, you know, by doing our dharma in this life and, and then maybe if we're in another life where it makes more sense or easier for us to, uh, to engage in that kind of strenuous, type of uh, seeking of spiritual enlightenment. You know, a, a lot of what happened was um, Eastern, you know, we're fascinated in the West by Eastern ideas, and, uh, you know, folks have taken advantage of that, and I don't mean that necessarily in a bad way, but taken advantage of our curiosity uh, and given us easily digestible forms of it. Hence, we have yoga classes and uh, you know you now hear about you know businesses trying to get their employees to do um, mindfulness meditation and, and that kind of stuff uh, is you know what I think is and, and that's just bound to happen I, I do think that it's it can be problematic when it becomes divorced from a tradition uh, and becomes an end in itself uh, I'm not saying that you have to be Hindu to do yoga, but I do think you have to find some way to uh, make those practices intelligible. Uh, otherwise, uh, I, I mean, it, it's almost, I think, disrespectful to the culture from which it's taken. I, I don't know. That's just some thoughts on my feet. Any I'm other? The Hare Krishna. The Hare Krishnas, yeah. So, so they, they are, that's a, that's a, a group that is uh, committed to bhakti yoga. Yeah. 
they are completely committed to devotion to Krishna, and for them that is the way of, and, and they actually reject a whole lot of the rest of Hinduism because of that. Yeah, they reject the Vedas and that kind of thing. But Krishna is just an avatar. Krishna is an avatar of, of Vishnu, that's right. So, so really it's Vishnu who they're... they're that's right, yeah. yeah. Any, any other questions?